Hi there, thanks for joining us today. I'm Phil Irvin from the St. Paul Seminary, joined by the guy in charge, Father Joseph Taphorn, the rector at the St. Paul Seminary here in St. Paul, Minnesota. The school year just kicked off. You're a very busy guy, so thanks for taking a, a few minutes to kind of give yeah, us an update thank you. on thanks. all things seminary. Happy to be here. Awesome. How's the year going so far? Well, we're off to a good start. So yeah. I think we're finally through the orientation activities, and we're, we're into the regular routine of things and settling into... Um, just a good orarium, what we call it, the, the, the daily schedule of prayer and study and work and formation. And I think we're off to a good start. Yeah. So we were just doing the math. You're starting your fifth full year as a rector. Has it, has it gone by fast? It has gone so by well? very yeah. quickly. You know, we, we people in society talk about the COVID time warp. So that does kind of, you know, it's hard to imagine things went so fast. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it actually has been five years. So um, every year has been different. Um, there's kind of no year has been the same. And yeah. obviously with COVID and other um, just being new, there were kind of a lot of uh, bumps along the way. But I feel like uh, God's been blessing us. That's good. What have, what have you learned? You've held a lot of different leadership positions in the church before this. You helped build a Newman Center back in Omaha. You worked at the Chancery there. You've obviously led um, a parish or two in your time. Um, but what have you learned in, in almost five years as a rector kind of about seminary formation and what it kind of uniquely takes to build the next generation of priests? and Yeah, well, I think in some ways, um, maybe one, one thought which would just be consistent with all of those is first, I think, to listen uh, to the Holy Spirit, see what is on God's heart, really, um, and then obviously collectively discern that with, with other leaders on the team. Uh, create that vision and then cast that vision. So I think it's very important in, in any position of leadership of an institution to make sure that we're listening to God first, what's on his heart, what are his desires, and then to be able to um, articulate that and then really live by that. And yeah. then in particular with priestly formation, of course, I think you know we, we take a lot of our um, inspiration from what the church herself gives us. So we're blessed to have a whole program of priestly formation, for example, which we're just now beginning kind of the sixth edition, a new edition that our bishops have approved. We have, of course, the writings of, um, of great saints like John Paul II, one of my personal heroes, and uh, his document now 30 years old, but it's still fresh and new. Uh, Pastores David Bobis, I will give you shepherd. So the principles of priestly formation, integral formation, uh, forming the whole man, it's not just sort of an academic or an intellectual pursuit, but 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 the whole person together, especially the, the human foundation. I think that one thing we stress at our seminary, and I think we've been very uh, good at, and I think it's really responding to the needs of the church today would be in the area of human formation. Yeah. Um, John Paul said very well um, in that document, and again, it rings true, that the priest has to mold his human personality to be a bridge and not an obstacle to Jesus Christ. And so the fact of the incarnation is that Christ chose to become man, and he chose to use uh, as he founded the church from Pentecost, uh, alive in the Holy Spirit, to continue to use human beings in relationship. And so our clergy, above all, really have to be men who can um, lean into relationships and use their personality to communicate the saving truths of the gospel. Yeah. Is that human piece more important than ever, just given the societal context that men are I think it is, yeah. In. I mean, I, th I think very much so. And uh, maybe there's a little touch of irony that we're doing this here with uh, largely social media and internet. Yeah. And of course, it's a great way to reach people. It's a beautiful tool for the gospel. But we know that kind of the dark edge of technology yeah. and how that can affect people and uh, in, in a sense make us less real and um, so virtual that it can affect sort of human relationships and just kind of genuine a kind of maturation. And so we see that in our young people. We see that certainly in my work with college students, and then those mm -hmm. college students go on at some point, many of them to become seminarians. Um, so it's kind of no, no surprise that the generation today, for example, would be different than, than priests ordained of my age a generation ago. And so we have to be just more attentive, I think, to some of the, just again, the human natural needs. Obviously, the um, difficulties in family life and, and um, broken homes, family of origin yeah. kinds of things. So the beautiful gift, though, I think, of seminary formation, and especially as we've created, I think, well, as best we can, a real environment of trust is that 
um, a man, we say, shows up for formation. In other words, he, he acknowledges who he is, and that's the blessings, and it's also uh, the challenges and, and areas of growth. And, and when the whole man shows up, well, now we can really have a good uh, conversation. And I think the fact that that happens day in and day out with an outstanding team of formators really bodes well for the future of the church. Yeah, and then that they go on to kind of discover themselves in such a way that they're then able to really minister well to Absolutely. That's right. And we, you know, I mean, I, I, I one of my favorite passages is John 10.10. 10. Uh, Jesus promising, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So really part of kind of our culture at the St. Paul Seminary would be what makes you come alive? You know, where are you fully alive? We want each man in formation to become fully alive and fully himself. And if that means the way he's most alive is to be a priest, then we bless that and and, and praise God and we're going to have him be the best possible priest. If him becoming fully alive is not that, and maybe he's got a vocation to marriage or another state in life, then we want to bless that too. So um, there, there's no sort of um, shame. There's no kind of losing way. God has a beautiful plan for each person. Uh, he wants every person to come fully alive with the gifts and talents uh, that he gives naturally and also the supernatural gifts. And our job is to help foster those, help a man grow into those, and then that's going to be the, the kind of priest we desire. Sure. If you walk around the halls or go to daily mass, the building seems fully alive right now. Exactly it is, yeah. One hundred seminarians. Yeah, so we're, congratulations. Thank That's you. Awesome. Yeah, well, it's it's been a team effort. There's been a lot of folks uh, inviting and encouraging, and we've been blessed over the last number of years to see uh, more bishops choose to send men to the St. Paul yeah. Seminary. We've seen, in particular, in this archdiocese, just a strong number of seminarians, and of course, um, as a arch, as an archdiocesan seminary. Uh, most of the men studying for the priesthood would um, receive their formation uh, for major seminary at the St. Paul Seminary. So we're just very, very blessed in, in those ways and um, excited about having a basically full house. We were just talking at dinner last night that I think we only have two guest rooms on the seminary and floors. And so a good problem to have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's pretty much capacity, right? I pretty much, least, yeah. So again, we could give up two guest yeah. rooms, and then after that, you have to start taking away things like the exercise room or yeah. we've got a computer room and things like that, you know. But um, yeah, so we could we could squeeze a few more in, but we're, we're pretty close to being like full. Like you said, it's a good problem to have. It's the largest seminary in enrollment um, in a decade. You mentioned more bishops choosing and trusting the seminary. Are there any other uh, things you'd attribute just kind of the robust enrollment to, especially when a lot of people watching this are probably very familiar with terms like vocation shortage and priest yeah. shortage and things like that. Well, I, th I think the men themselves are kind of our best, um, I hate to say it, advertiser. That's not the right word I'm looking for. But, but the best promotion, you might say, would sure. be, are the seminarians happy? Are they engaged? Yeah. Are they flourishing? Are they coming to life? And as, uh, as the men themselves uh, really make a home, uh, I just had a, a new man uh, in my office. I meet with all the what we call the new men. We have 36 new men this year of that 100, so 36 new to us. So again, a, just a strong sign of growth. Yeah. And so I like to meet with each one and, and get to know uh, each one. And uh, he remarked on a kind of a point I had made in my opening uh, conference to the new men about the seminary. Uh, this is your home for a priest or a seminarian. Our home is where our bishop assigns us. Um, um, I'm not a priest of this archdiocese, but my archbishop back in Omaha and Archbishop Hebda have asked that I serve here uh, for this kind of season of my life. So this is my home. and, yeah. and um, you know, and, and sometimes you're away from what's familiar, but um, that that's where home. Anyhow, he made the point how much that resonated with him and how grateful he was. And it's just kind of helped him to kind of settle in, uh, maybe in the midst of a little bit of homesickness himself or whatever things may be, just to know, oh, yeah, this is actually, you know, where God wants me to flourish and, and feel at home. So I think when men can experience that, uh, the depth of fraternity, of brotherhood, um, caring formators, environment of trust, ability, again, to, to be real and to be known. Um, again, even with those growth areas or challenges, that really makes for a happy, healthy place. And that's yeah. going to be, you know, more than any, uh, I appreciate all the slick brochures, you know, that, that your <laughs> office produces. But even more than that, right, is the testimony of the men who, who live here day 100%. in and day out. And yeah. when they can speak to their bishops and their friends, uh, or brother seminarians maybe that they meet elsewhere, that's going to be a source of attraction. Well, in big numbers like 100 seminarians look good on those brochures or in social media, but what you're talking about is it's not just quantity, but, but quality of both the formation they receive and then the men who leave here, like you said, whether they become priests or not. Absolutely, right. And I, I know we've 
remarked, I think, again, we're all getting to know kind of this new house, but I think collectively have been very impressed with, with just the, the new crop of men that God has brought uh, to us, and we're excited to uh, just live life together and do that work day in and day out of formation. Sure. So also for those who don't know, if you want to be a permanent deacon in the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, you go through St. Paul Seminary, the Institute for Diaconate Formation. Uh, guys get ordained every few years, and there's an ordination class coming up in December of 18 men, which ties the largest diaconate ordination class ever for this archdiocese. Um, how important is it for the local church to have a strong diaconate presence as well? Yeah, well, you know, obviously we, you know, as a seminary, first on the list is priestly formation, but right next to that, it, we say, is deacon. So yeah. kind of our three groups of folks, priest, deacons, and lay leaders, this is the group that we form. If you go back to the earliest days of the church, I mean, even in the Acts of the Apostles, we hear about deacons, you know, we think of... Uh, you know, uh, the martyrdom of St. Stephen, for example, you know, in the Acts of the Apostles. So really from the earliest days, the very constitution of the church had these uh, different orders uh, of service, uh, the bishop, the priest, and the deacon. And we find this really from the very beginning. So it makes sense then that um, deacons are clergy. Uh, they're sacred ministers in the church. They have their own set of documents, you might say, from the Vatican yep. and from the Conference of Bishops, very similar to what we do with priestly formation in terms of um, four dimensions of formation, the human, the spiritual, intellectual, and pastoral. Really, a lot of the things that we do for the seminarians are also that same kind of language and vision is cast for the deacons. Obviously, it's going to look differently. You're dealing with more mature men, uh, men who are married, often have families, often uh, because they need to provide for their families. They have other work, maybe in addition to some kind of parish service or duty. So they're not going to be living uh, in the seminary, for example, because they're family men. So it's going to look differently, yeah. but it still is a very intentional formation process. And you might say sort of the, the resources, the expertise uh, from both our, our academic faculty to the spiritual formators to uh, counseling services, all those kinds of things are also available than to the men who are preparing for uh, ordination of the permanent diaconate. So we do see that as very important. And, and in parish life, I think most people realize um, the importance of having deacon or deacons who can not just assist at the altar, but in particular uh, with the work of charity or the work of administration. There's, there's all kinds of things that a deacon um, can do. And he has a particular relationship to the church and to the bishop himself because yeah. of the fact that he is a cleric and he's the same sort of promise of obedience uh, that, that a young or that a newly ordained priest makes a donation is also made uh, by a permanent deacon. So there's that very strong ecclesial bond and the deacon himself too. Also we say is a little bit of a bridge just as the, the priest is supposed to be the bridge in his humanity between Christ and the people in a certain sense the deacon is a little bit of that bridge between the clerical world, the clergy and the lady. They live in both um, worlds. A little bit. Yeah, I mean they, they are clergy lot, but yeah. you know but there's they 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 know sort of they're, they're to know the needs of the people. Um, liturgically we see this for example it's the deacon who should proclaim and lead what we call the universal prayer or the general intercessions because the the, the the thought here theologically is that the deacon has a better pulse on kind of the needs of the people so he should be the one to kind of craft that prayer and be able to pray for the general and the particular needs of that community because he's one of them he's drawn from them and uh, he's able then to really kind of carry their needs and burdens and also again respond as needed uh, with works of charity. Yeah. There's so much beauty in just the practicality of that. Exactly, yeah. Great. And you mentioned the lay piece too. Um, I think it always needs reminding the seminary does form lay people. You've got master's programs, catechetical institute. If you kind of add all those together, you're talking about you know, close to 900 people who are enrolled right now. Um, why is a seminary a good place for a layperson to be formed? Might not always yeah, think of well, that it's, as, again, uh, it's kind of, of similar to the part with the deacons. Again, maybe may a little further extended out, but yep. we do believe that the formation we provide is to be in the, all these different dimensions. So it's not just getting a master's degree, but we were very intentional uh, in our programs that we're also paying attention to opportunities for spiritual growth, for human growth. 
um, for instance, the Master of Arts in Pastoral Leadership degree specifically has a very pastoral element to it. So that might be a good degree for folks who imagine maybe desiring to work in the church professionally, perhaps as a director of religious education or other kind of um, parish ministry. We started a couple years ago one of our newest programs, the Certificate in Catholic School Leadership, uh, specifically for Catholic school leaders' principles or rising principles, so that they can get some more, not just theology, but also practice in what it's like to lead a, a yeah. nonprofit in the Catholic Church and to be able to cast a vision and to uh, address problems based upon, you know, Catholic anthropology and, and how we would sort of view the world. It's going to be different than it might be in a public school system, of course. So it really is, in, and, you know, the clergy, um, you know, we obviously need priests and deacons and a lot of them, but most of the church is the laity, right? And so the, the church, we say, would look very funny if it was just clergy. Uh, and we don't want that. That's not what our Lord intended. But what a gift to be able to form lay leaders. Um, the Catechetical Institute, I think you mentioned, we're very proud of that. And particularly the work that we call it the CI for short has been doing to partner with the Archdiocese in the Synod implementation here locally, yeah. uh, forming leaders, the, the parish evangelization teams. So it's just an exciting time, I think, for so much. You can really see the Holy Spirit at work in so many ways. Uh, and we see the seminary being in the mix of all of it. It reminds me of a line of Archbishop Flynn of Happy Memory, who used to say that the seminary is at the heart of the local church. And I think that's very true here. In this archdiocese, obviously we serve you know, 16 dioceses in the upper Midwest, uh, but in particular, there is that real connection, I think, to the archdiocese here in St. Paul and Minneapolis. So we wanna be in the mix, we wanna be doing our mission of formation, and um, whether it's, again, priest deacons or lay leaders, we think we have something to offer. Absolutely. Last one, and we'll get you out of here. It probably seems like a long time ago with everything we've been talking about. How was your summer? What were some well, of the highlights? The highlights. The you summer got the sailboat of, out a few got times, the, I know, Got the so. Hobie Cat out a couple of times, and uh, always fun on the Hobie Cat. And then, um, you know, it was a great summer. It was a mix of, um, I would say, uh, work uh, and play, yeah. and, which is a good thing. On the work side, you know, I was I was able to help give a retreat in Omaha with the Institute for Priestly Formation, and that's always a, a privilege and um, a group I've been fond of. And of course, it's from my home archdiocese, yeah. and they do such important work. So to be part of that and reconnect um, with friends there, and of course, spend some time with family in Omaha was great. Was able to make my own retreat um, um, in July as well uh, with with a, a actually a priest, one of the founders of the IPF, Father John Horn. So a blessing to be with him for a silent directed retreat, was able to teach a little bit in ongoing uh, formation for seminary formators down in Florida. So I was an instructor for a week um, at the Seminary Formation Council, and then was also to take a couple of vacations. And um, so it was great. In the meantime, try to get back, keep up with mail and email and yeah. do the best I can. So it's like the rest of us. Yeah. Sometimes Busy I say time. no trip goes unpunished. <laughs> you That's come right. Come back and That's the inbox right. is full, but I think you probably have it a little worse than, than I do with everything you got going on. So, well, thanks for the time. Good luck with the rest of the school year. And uh, yeah, thanks for being here. Awesome. Thank you, Appreciate Phil. Appreciate it. Thank you for watching. Be sure to subscribe. You can also check us out on stpaulseminary.org as well as Facebook and Instagram. God bless.